as mentioning beforehand, we're coming out of winter and looking forward to warmer days ahead. But to be fair, it has been a tough winter for many people in New Zealand and not just the weather, some very difficult economic times. And honestly, the forecasts aren't looking brilliant. Yes, uh, the Reserve Bank changed the OCR, but for a lot of people trapped in poverty, that in itself isn't going to make a difference for them. Uh, Today, looking at two particular groups that are struggling with, uh, well, increasing levels of poverty. The old and the young in our society. Joining me on the program now is uh, Dr. Bonnie Robinson. She is a part of the team at the Salvation Army Social Policy and Parliamentary Unit. Bonnie, kia ora, good morning. Kia ora, good morning to you. Firstly, uh, looking at some of the statistics to do with with older people, there's been recent reports to say that, that, hey, in a decade, uh, there'll be such a huge number of people receiving superannuation benefit that will be struggling to pay for it. In the meantime, though, those people who are on superannuation are struggling to make ends meet. And there's, there's a bit of a game changer in the housing status of that group of people. Yes, that's right. I mean, New Zealand's been a world leader for a long time in terms of having a universal pension, universal superannuation that's available to everybody. And for a long time, what that meant was we basically lifted most older people out of poverty. We weren't necessarily um, incredibly well off, but we lifted most older people out of poverty. The issue is that that um, whole system assumed in terms of housing, people would reach retirement, reach 65, either with a mortgage-free home Mm -hmm. or in an affordable rental. So usually a a government house or a council um, pensioner flat. Um, So basically the pension level assumed that your housing situation was stable and affordable for you. Uh, and then you could you could just about live on the pension. But that increasingly isn't the case. Increasingly, we've got people arriving at age 65 and they don't have a mortgage-free home. Uh, they're either still paying a mortgage or they don't own a home and they are um, dependent on the rental market. Yeah. And um, some of these people have been in private rental all their lives, not in a state house or a council house. Uh, and when they reach retirement and they're, they're suddenly dependent on the pension, they can no longer afford that market rental. Yeah. And there's very limited options for them. And, and so that housing situation, combined with cost of living crisis, yeah. is starting to see older people slip um, in, into poverty. Now, this isn't a situation 10 years away. This is something that you're seeing now with the Salvation Army. The uh, and, and it is something that that is perhaps more prevalent overseas, but that combination of older people, retirees who are also homeless? Yes, we are starting to see there's some information coming from Australia, particularly, of what we call first-time homelessness amongst yeah. older people. So people who've never been homeless in their lives, they've maintained rent um, or a home, and but when they retire... Uh, suddenly they can no longer find affordable housing yeah. on, on their pension income. Um, we are seeing older people at our food. We always have seen a, a small number, yeah. uh, and it, it, it it's still not a huge number, but um, we definitely have older people turning up at food banks. Some would say that, um, well, hey, older people have had more time it than... Is- my- oh, sorry. It's a slight glitch uh, well, in the they, technology they, there. Yeah, they tend to. Yeah, sorry. They tend to. Um, they tend to hide their level of distress, so yeah. they're much less likely to ask for um, for assistance. And so, when they do turn up, they've probably been in a difficult situation for quite some time. Yeah. When it comes to tackling this issue, of course, there are two ways of of skinning this cat, as it were. One is uh, to to increase the level of their income of superannuation, which seems very unaffordable given the the age blip which is coming our way. The other one, of course, is to have more uh, housing available uh, for the elderly. But this this is something that, that needs to be worked on, or at least a proportion of of housing allocated that way. 
And absolutely. And and I think one of our problems is that uh, there hasn't been enough pre-planning looking yeah. at the population. Uh, so we're going to be in a massive catch-up because one-bedroom accommodation uh, is, is what a lot of old people need, both yeah. in terms of affordability uh, and also they're living on their own. But the other thing they often need is uh, an accessible, a disability-friendly home. Yeah. Uh, and so, and we certainly haven't got enough of that in the social housing, um, the Kayangaroa housing space for the population that's coming. So we really do need to get cracking on that. Otherwise, I think we are going to see more actual homelessness amongst older people uh, and definitely more older people slipping below the poverty line. And one of the issues is that we do have a percentage of old people, about 20% of people over 65, who've got a little bit more than the pension, but not much. Yeah. And that often puts them in a difficult situation because they've got too much money for the government to help them, mm -hmm. but not enough money to help themselves. Yeah. And so I think looking at things like the asset levels for the accommodation supplement in terms of older people, um, those kinds of things need to be urgently looked at because otherwise we're going to, as I say, have this group of people who uh, they're just going to fall between the cracks mm. uh, because that, you know, they might have saved a little bit over their lifetime, but it's not going to um, give them a um, an adequate home um, for the rest of their retirement. Looking at the other end of the spectrum, and hey, some people may say, well, hey, at least older people have had time to perhaps prepare for this. But for young people, for uh, child poverty in New Zealand, now again, this is something where New Zealand has been leading the world and there's been cross-party support for uh, tackling child poverty in New Zealand. This is a good thing, but some recent tinkering by the current government into what the targets are for child poverty reduction. Yes, so the Child Poverty Reduction Act requires the government to set targets, and, and that's a good thing mm -hmm. uh, because it does focus the mind. But recently, uh, the government um, altered their target so that, that they... Um, they altered it so that it, they have a, a lower target, so they're not having to reduce it as much. Yeah. Now, they've said that that's realistic, um, but I was just reflecting on this. We were reflecting on it and going, we need to realise what that actually means. So when we say that you know we're, we're going to leave X percentage of children in poverty, we're basically saying we're okay with leaving uh, a chunk of children in poverty. Mm. And... And my view is that really we need to have that um, that target as zero uh, because that's the ethical and moral thing to do is to say that actually our target for children in poverty in this country is zero. Mm. Now, we recognise you're not going to get to that tomorrow, yep. but we would hope that by having a child poverty target as zero and maintaining that all the time, it really focuses our mind on what do we have to do to get there? Uh, but to have a target which says, okay, we'll, um, we'll halve the number of children in poverty by X. Yep. It sounds good, but it actually means we've still got this big chunk of children who are in poverty and we're going, we'll get to you at some point. Mm. And I think the thing to note with children is children can't wait. Yeah. The effects of poverty on them are happening right now and they will potentially impact them for the rest of their lives. So kind of saying, well, we're, we're happy for this number of children to have to wait even longer. We need to look at what the, the downstream impact of this is and recognise that for children, um, a year is a long time yeah. in the life of a child. When, I suppose when it comes to the aspirational goal of eradicating child poverty, is it fair to say, hey, let's have some incremental goals on our way towards that goal and for it not to be aspirational, for this to be an actual uh, goal and a target of the government, but recognising that we won't get there tomorrow, that we need to take steps that will be incremental gains towards that goal. So the overall target may be zero, but there's other smaller targets that we're hoping to hit on our way towards that strategically. I, I think certainly we can have uh, we can have steps that we say we aim to do this this year. I think the key is though if we say that our target is zero, yep. um, we're going to be much more motivated to look at every option from every kind of uh, 
side of politics and economics and theory uh, because we've got this really important goal uh, that we want to reach as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with uh, having your target as less than zero uh, is, yes, you can always shift that target because um, things change. Uh, and, and you're possibly less urgently motivated. Whereas when it's zero, um, you look at every option, uh, you weigh up your decisions very carefully because actually, unless you get to zero, you haven't you haven't met the goal. We've left so some I children behind. Highly motivated. Yeah. yeah, no, no, definitely. There's also a bit of an issue on this one where, where some people may be concerned that, that child poverty do we have some clear definitions on that? Because in, in terms of poverty, yes, it is a, a, a real a reality for many people in New Zealand. But I suppose as we get closer to reducing poverty in New Zealand, then uh, it becomes relative to other people in society. Is it the sort of thing that we can have a zero target, given that uh, that poverty is a, a comparative measure it's a poverty compared to other people do we need to make sure that there's some fixed measures there that it's not as relative well we do have a number of ways of measuring poverty in new zealand that are official ways of measuring poverty that the government use yeah. uh, and and they are about very concrete things so we talk about material hardship so there's been research done that shows what are the things that you need to have to live a healthy life, yeah. you know, to to basically have a good and healthy life, and and we know that if you are missing a number of those components, mm -hmm. uh, if you are in material hardship and you have an, a number of those components missing, that you will be negatively affected by that. So yeah. your educational outcomes will be less, your health will be poorer, uh, you know, a whole lot of things that we want for people across the board in New Zealand. I would hope are made worse if you are below these poverty line measures. And there are a number of them. Mm. Um, so I think it's it's a quite a well-researched area now. Yeah. Uh, and yes, we're not talking about absolute poverty that you get in other countries mm -hmm. where people are literally starving to death. Yeah. But I would hope we would never want that in New Zealand. So it's about to live a good and healthy life uh, and to be able to contribute to society and to maybe and to be able to, to use your skills and gifts, uh, what do you need? And and we measure and we've got some pretty clear research on on what people need. And when people don't have enough of that, what happens to them? So I think it's quite well researched mm. and that as we reduce poverty, we can measure that. And certainly we've seen reductions. Uh, up until um, this year, we were starting to make some gains. They weren't huge, but we were making gains in terms of child poverty. So we can measure it. It can be quite con concrete. So we're talking uh, base level, not not comparative uh, yeah, poverty. Yeah, not, then. not yeah. saying, you know, um, you know, they've got a pony, I want one too. <laughs> yep. This is about, exactly. I've got food, I've got heat. I can go to the doctor when I'm sick. Mm. Um, you know, I can participate at school uh, in sports, um, you know, in, in, in the, the normal things that the children are doing. So yeah. uh, I can have clothes that are appropriate to my age and stage of life. You know, mm. I can have shoes on my feet that fit. You know, so these are very basic core things that yep. we're talking about. Um, they're not the nice to haves, you know, mm. it wouldn't it be nice to have one of those. Yeah. It's the you need this to live a healthy life. And, to, and for children, you need this to grow up for your brain to develop, for you to develop socially, for you to be a healthy physical person. And I think the the research is also very clear that the uh, the, the financial costs of not doing this are much higher than investing in in tackling this. And I, I love the philosophy of of hey, let's not say well, let's help some of the children, let's leave no child behind. Uh, Bonnie, yep. thank you so much for the work that you do uh, with the Salvation Army. Thank you so much for your thoughts, your comments, and for joining us today. Thank you. Hey, thanks very much for joining us in the Rima studio. Thanks very much for watching the interview. It's kind of nice to have an audience, actually. And if you did like what you watched, then do give us a like, do give us the thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more interviews like that one, or perhaps even better, subscribe and those interviews will come straight to you. Don't forget to turn on your notifications and we'll see you in the next one. Cheers.